Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today is Dr. Martin Luther King Day. It's a day dedicated to the memory and legacy of the man who was our country's formative figure in the fight for civil rights. Long before Dr. King, back in 1838, the first African American graduated from the University of Vermont. Only in the past few years has the story of that man, Andrew Harris, been understood. As Rebecca Gollin tells us, the university has taken steps to celebrate, honor, and recognize the nearly forgotten graduate. He was, we know, a very strong advocate for education and particularly education for African Americans. Andrew Harris was a member of UVM's class of 1838. He was one of 24 graduates that year. A few years older than most of his classmates, Harris was already a community and religious leader in Troy, New York by the time of his graduation. What set him apart was not his age or his accomplishments, however. It was the color of his skin. I was alerted to Andrew Harris by my friend Bob Buckeye at the Middlebury College Library. And uh, there was a, uh, a biography of him uh, in the the Black Abolitionist Papers, which is a, a great reference source on uh, 19th century abolitionists. And uh, so I looked that up and did a little research here and found that, yes, indeed, he was enrolled at UVM um, and had been largely forgotten. Harris was so forgotten that until about two decades ago, George Washington Henderson, who graduated in 1877, had been celebrated as UVM's first black graduate, with a portrait in the Waterman Building and a cafe named for him in the university's student center. Although Henderson was incredibly accomplished, Harris defied the odds by graduating nearly 40 years earlier in a nation where slavery was not yet abolished and the Civil War wouldn't be fought for more than 20 years. There are no known pictures of Harris. He was a leader, he was an ordained minister, um, as well as he was an abolitionist. And um, he really believed in equality and he really wanted full citizenships, particularly um, for African Americans at that time. And so um, his, his, his hard work, his dedication, and his passion um, really, sort of really stood out. Um, and Wanda Hedding Grant is the vice president place. for human um, resources, again, my, diversity, my and multicultural affairs at UVM. At that time. She says that Harris came to UVM at a time that the university was on the cutting edge of social inclusion, while still participating in the racism that was so pervasive in that era. President Wheeler, who admitted Harris despite the protests of much of the student body, was himself a devoted colonizationist. That's to say, that although Wheeler opposed slavery, he also believed that slaves, as well as the free colored population of the United States, should be sent back to their native lands. If you can imagine in thinking around, you know, 1838 graduating and the time before that and what, um, you know, our society was like at that time and, and to a certain degree we're still working on a lot of issues, but uh, to be denied access and equality um, because of the color of one's skin and to um, also not be able to um, be a part of what it really meant to be a student in higher learning, um, to always be sort of set aside in some kind of way. I'm not sure how he was able to endure that. UVM was not Harris's first choice. He was first rejected by both Union College and Middlebury. We don't know exactly why he uh, continued on to Burlington, but uh, uh, perhaps he had heard that he might have a better reception here. Harris's difficulties did not end once he began classes as a sophomore in November of 1835. Many of his classmates never warmed up to his presence, and his name is not listed in the catalog of students, which is one reason he remained unknown for so long. In addition, his name is listed out of order on many records, last instead of alphabetical. And Harris's final farewell from UVM at his graduation may have been the greatest insult. Apparently, his classmates took a final stand against his presence. 
According to an account from an attendee that was later printed in the anti-slavery newspaper The Liberator, Harris, quote, was not permitted to speak or to come upon the platform to receive his diploma, but was obliged to take it one side. The class declared that if he came upon the stage, they would have nothing to do with the exercises. In addition, Harris was not allowed to deliver his prepared speech, which was required by each graduate at the time. The fact that he came here while slavery was still uh, uh, existing in the South um, and uh, became an active abolitionist himself um, really uh, said something about his character. Can you imagine Burlington, Vermont at that time? A small, bustling waterfront town surrounded by farms, deep woods, mill towns, and a population that didn't include many who looked like Andrew Harris. After leaving UVM, Harris expanded his already substantial role as a community, religious, and political leader, delivering fiery anti-slavery speeches to increasingly large crowds and becoming an ordained minister. He moved to Philadelphia in 1839 and became pastor at a small church in the city. Harris was making a name for himself, all was going well, until November of 1841, when Harris came down with a fever and died a few weeks later, just 27 years old. We might have had um, much more to say about Andrew Harris and all the great things that he would have accomplished and um, done to make this a better place for all of us um, in terms of equality and equity and access. A promising life cut tragically short and a history finally put right at UVM. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next segment looks at what's fair and what's equal when it comes to estate planning. For farm families, transferring ownership from one generation to the next is complicated. And that's why experts recommend having the difficult discussions about estate planning while we're still able. Across the Fence has visited with a number of farm families that are going through ownership transitions, including a family in Cornwall that's in the apple business. Keith Silva tells us more. Like many fathers and sons, Barney Hodges, senior and junior, like to kid with one another. The trees are supposed to be four feet, and then when I wasn't looking, Dad moved them to five feet over there. Well, they were bigger trees. They screwed the trees up for life. The Hodges own and operate Sunrise Orchards in Cornwall. They grow apples on 200 acres and sell their entire crop wholesale. The packing line hums in the winter and spring, and by the time last year's crop is packed and shipped, the buds are on the trees and the process begins again. Sunrise Orchards was started by Hodges Sr. as a business partnership. When his partner left the day-to-day -day operations in 1994, Hodges was advised to change the business structure from a partnership to a corporation. My accountant seemed to advise me that way, and I think it was probably a mistake at that time because we weren't making money. If, if you're making good money, then it's good to have a corporation, but if you're losing money, or you're better off without having a corporation. Hodges was strictly a grower and had little control over the price he was paid for the crop. When I planted the orchard, I sent all the apples down to the Shoreham Co-op. At harvest time, they stored them, they packed them out. All I had to do was wait for the money. Then the money became kind of meager. After a couple of successful off-farm careers, Barney Jr. returned to the farm in 1998 to find that the family business was failing. When Barney wanted to come on board, I advised him not to at the time because we were having, financially we were having a hard time. We were struggling. And I would say in 1998, this was not a viable business. Um, so any type of successional planning is a moot point when you don't have a viable business, it's not gonna work. So at that point, the plan was, what's our exit strategy? And our exit strategy is liquidating the real estate. When the next generation gets involved, the ante is increased significantly because suddenly two families are needing to be supported rather than one. 
And I looked at the business at that time and, and there was no way that was going to happen doing what we were doing. Faced with selling the farm, Barney Sr. gave his son his blessing and Barney Jr. began selling apples out of the back of his station wagon. Over time, he built up clientele and drastically changed the business since coming on board in 1998. Where we were a horizontally in integrated business, we are now a vertically integrated business where we own our own storage, our own packing house, our own trucks. We sell much of our own fruit. We develop new relationships, completely change the, the business. Sunrise Orchards is two branches from the same tree. Barney Jr. and his wife Christiana own the corporation, which consists of the crop and the equipment. The real estate in the buildings are owned by Barney Sr. and his wife Pat. And now it's time to transfer those assets to the younger generation as well. We need to invest in the infrastructure here. So far, every construction project has gone to increase the assets of my parents. And uh, as long as they've been the primary owner of the corporation, that's been okay. But now we own the corporation and we take on debt sometimes to build a building or make an improvement or put in a packing line, build a storage building. And whenever we're doing that, we're building the asset base of the estate, not of our own personal mm -hmm. assets. It's not that we have a problem with that, but it just doesn't make sense to continue in that trajectory. So now we're working toward transferring real estate ownership, and that's a huge challenge. I have two older sisters, and uh, we have to be open and clear and communicate as a family to try to figure that out. What is unique about this uh, farm is they're selling apples, they're not dairy farm. Uh, they do a lot of re direct retail selling. That's about where the uniqueness ends. Bob Parsons, an agricultural economist with the University of Vermont Extension, works with farm families on planning for a farm transfer. One of the biggest challenges in farm succession is determining what is fair and what is equal when it comes to children not involved in the farm business. Splitting this farm up equally is not fair. But the hard decision then is, if, if equal is not fair, then what is fair? The best solution is one that it is not rushed, but discussed with the real practicalities of the implications of what it means for everybody, so that everybody gets their feelings on the table, and then you, uh, somebody has to end up making a, a decision. The business is successful because of the land that it is using. If we change the ownership of the land and the control of that land different from what it is today, we may be killing the business. And that's something that the parents have to realize. Talk this through in the bigger picture. As co-owner of Sunrise Orchards Corporation, Christiana Hodges has a significant stake in the future of this farm business. For her, communication is key. We have had many, many discussions with uh, Barney's sisters and his mom and dad about, you know, the different sort of ideas we have for how to take ownership of the farm and how to continue the farm in the future. And it has taken a really long time, but no one, I, I don't get the feeling that anyone is frustrated by that. I think people have come to a lot of conclusions over the last decade and that's, that's been really helpful. So being really patient, communicating, and I mean really deliberately, like in the form of um, you know, surveys and face-to-face -face meetings and um, just any time you can get together and talk about it, it's really important. Because ultimately, you know, we all want everybody to be happy. But fair versus equal is somewhat subjective. The Hodges believe their farm transfer will happen relatively soon. Sunrise Orchards is the Hodges family, and the Hodges family is Sunrise Orchards. For both to grow and thrive, it will take patience, communication, and understanding. And it doesn't hurt to have a little luck on your side either. But having your son come in is a real blessing. I mean, I, I couldn't be luckier. If I, if I didn't have a son coming in business, taking over the business, you know, the farm would eventually be sold. From father to son, and from one generation to the next, there's a lot on the horizon for Sunrise Orchards. In Cornwall, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. 
For more information about transferring the family farm, check the website on your screen. It's uvm.edu slash farm transfer. The site has information about upcoming workshops and videos from a wide variety of Vermont farming families. And that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.